Okay, welcome everyone to our first uh, Hangout for My Community Manager, which is the worldwide edition. Um, you've all seen Tim McDonald's uh, Hangouts, I think, on Google+. And um, for the first Hangout, we're going to do uh, the ROI with online communities with Addy Gaskell. Um, but before Addy introduces himself, I thought maybe if everybody in the Hangout wants to briefly explain who they are and what they do, that would be great. And if we wanted to start maybe with uh, Liz and then move on from there. Uh, thanks, Ben. Um, I'm Liz, and um, I work for StopThinkSocial.com. I host a Monday show on Social Inside Your Business and Twitter Thursday Twitter chat. Um, and I'm community manager for our social business SW Chat community. Okay, cool. And um, Steve. Um, yeah, I'm Steve. I'm in Amsterdam. I work for. Uh, I have my own agency called Storywise. Um, we're focused on editorial strategy, which is basically content which feeds communities and feeds social business. Okay, brilliant. And um, Kaz? Uh, so I'm the community manager for a social Q&A site called Blurtit.com. Uh, so we're kind of like the biggest rival to Quora, we like to think. But uh, yeah. And yeah, I organize like online and offline events in my, in my spare time as well. Okay, cool. And you've got a hangout on Friday. You're doing what? What was that about? Um, so that's that's to do with the uh, with blurted.com with our site. Uh, it's sort of like a community engagement event and, and something that we're trialing to sort of you know get people to engage with each other and uh, yeah get a bit more traction on our site really. Okay, cool. And and Jack, do you want to explain um what you and I do? Sure. I work uh, with Ben. Uh, we're both uh, community managers for the uh, site uh, BizCrowd, which is run by the banks NatWest and RBS. Uh, basically, the idea is just to connect uh, kind of B2B connectivity for small to medium enterprises and to get them on the site and generating uh, some good business leads, basically. Okay. And Addy, finally, um, I've, I've been reading your blog, which is why I wanted to invite you to the Hangout in the first place. Thanks for your patience getting it set up. Um, do you want to explain a little bit about yourself and what you do? Yeah, I, I kind of come at the um, community management angle from the, very much the enterprise side of things. So I'm, I'm looking at social business and how um, organizations can tap into communities to improve their innovation, their product development, their, their financing and that kind of thing. Um, it's a, a fascinating area of work to, to be in. I'm sure you'd all agree and hopefully this will be a, a fun session to take part in. It's my first one as well, so hopefully it'll go well. That's right, and um, yeah, we had a few technical troubles. Hopefully, that's not going to be visible from from the recording. But um, we we were hoping to talk to you about sort of the uh, the ROI of community and sort of maybe um, the value you can get from it, and um, maybe how to measure it. Um, and so I sort of thought maybe a good initial question would be, you know, what is a community? Whether it's you know hashtag or a search term or forum, do you think that's sort of an important question to ask before you go on to the ROI? Yeah, I think it's it's certainly a good question to ask because with any community, first of all, you need to figure out if it's worth having. Um, I think the very best communities out there have a a common purpose that sort of tie them all together, and that that is in essence what what binds the community together. Um, and so, if you don't have that purpose to begin with, then it's very difficult to to have a community. Um, and I think too often, as a as an industry, we get bogged down by the various platforms that are out there, and feel that we have to have a Twitter account or a Facebook page or a LinkedIn group or anything, and we we lose track of what it is we're trying to achieve with our communities. Um, and so I think it's always valuable if you boil it down to its bare essence and figure out what it is you want to achieve with your community, um, what it is that will derive value for the, for the members of that community, and then figure out whether it's a, an online community, an offline community, whether it's doing something on Kickstarter or um, Facebook or anything like that, and, and very much leave the technology to the end um, and work out the, the cultural side of things first. I was, I was reading a lot of blogs yesterday, I don't know if it was yours or maybe another one, Richard Stacey's, or, but someone was saying that a community is more of a process than, than the platform. Would you agree with that? 
Yeah, I mean, definitely coming from a innovative, um, from an enterprise perspective. I mean, we've been seeing recently um, Yahoo have been sort of banning people from working from home. And the rationale behind that was to get people into the office more and, and having those sort of serendipitous conversations with each other and, and hoping that will spark innovation. Um, so they're trying to have their community at the, at the Yahoo HQ rather than relying on the sort of enterprise social networks that you have on your intranets and that kind of thing to, to do that for them. Um, so I don't think necessarily a community even has to be online. It can be a very much an offline thing or or an online thing. Um, if if anybody else says it's about the people rather than the tools you use to connect people together. I was just saying, if anybody wanted to chip in, then just uh, just to say so. Obviously, as when Addy's talking, because I might not, I might forget to ask. Um, does anybody else have anything to say? Yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering what, what uh, uh, how do you actually define a community, AD? Um, I suppose it's loosely defined as a group of people that are, are getting together around a, a common purpose. Um, I think that kind of sums it up quite succinctly in my eyes, certainly. So if we have... Um if we have people, for example, on Twitter that are, um, say, sharing content <coughs> around a particular topic, does it, is that enough to say that's a community? Uh, well, I mean, we, we had the the Boston bombings recently where a lot of people were taking to Twitter and, and Reddit and places like that to, to help with the crime fighting efforts um, and help to hunt down the people that that did that. Um, now, I, I think you could argue that was a, an impromptu community developed around that shared purpose of, of trying to find the people that, that set the bomb off. Um, it wasn't something that anyone designed. Um, it was very much an impromptu thing, but I, I think it was very much a community still. So it's, it's one of the challenges then for, um, I mean, it's certainly what, what I found with um, uh, working with my clients is that Communities can either form themselves um, uh, impromptu and, they, and they're, they're fairly temporal, but then the real trick for enterprises is to actually uh, nurture and su sustain engagement over time, and that's actually what makes a community, right? Yeah, and it's, it's certainly difficult to sustain things, but uh, again, I don't think it, it's necessarily a bad thing if the community has run its course that it, it does dissipate. Um, Unless you have that ongoing purpose that that binds it together, then I don't think it's necessary that you have to keep it together for the community's sake. Um, I mean, if you've got a community that come together, for instance, to raise money for a particular startup on Kickstarter, um, the core purpose of that community is to raise the money to help get the, the venture off the ground. Um, Obviously, you could argue that it's nice then to keep that community together to help them um, engage with the, the company that they're founding. Um, but that's a very different purpose, I think, with a very different yeah. outcome. So, so can I just ask, Addy, so, so would you draw two clear distinctions for online communities, kind of one between one kind of type of community that pop up, like the Boston bombing example that you gave, that pop up just through social causes and they're quite fleeting, and then the other that are quite clearly designed for kind of, um, you know, for ROI and for, for a business purpose? Would there be like the two categories that you'd put communities into or do we have others? Um, I'd say both of them have a very clear purpose. I mean, it's just the time scales differ as to how long it takes to achieve that purpose. Um, I mean, with the Boston bombings, once they found the people that had conducted it, then there's not really much need for that community to, to stay together unless they're, they're planning on forming some kind of Batman vigilante group that go around trying to solve all manner of crimes in, in Boston. Um, so you sort of like a community <laughs> has, um, a community wants it's delivered the value to an extent and it doesn't need to exist anymore. So suppose that leads you on to like what value a community should deliver and maybe what the ROI of it needs to be and how you measure it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, 
and, and too often I think communities don't have that clear sort of end point in mind um, and without that it's very difficult to make communities working well um, whether it's actually achieved its outcome and if you don't know that then you can't take remedial action and, and try and get things back on track or if it's not working at all let it sort of fade away um, there was a nice study, I think it was by Deloitte um, last year, suggesting that the community is very much a, its, its purpose should be taken from the core goals of the organization, um, whether that's to go into a new market or to reduce their customer support costs or, or whatever they may be, and then you work back from those core organizational goals and, and figure out a way that your community can help to achieve that. Um, and it sort of breaks down into a, a social ROI and a financial ROI. So we were to, to take a customer service example, for instance. You have a, a social ROI there with every customer support query that a, a fellow community member answers rather than a, a call centre staff answers. That's a... a, a an iteration of your social ROI, and then you can extrapolate from that a, a financial value of how how much money you would save by not going to a call centre and having your community answer that for you. Um, and if you can have those social and financial ROIs going in the right direction, then I think that's that's a nice way of measuring whether your community is working. I wonder if people think that there's. I mean, um, I been sort of involved I've watched a few communities where sometimes you might think um, what the what the founders what the stakeholders of that community what their interests are and what the members interests are aren't sometimes always aligned do you see what I mean and you know obviously I mean, that's very important isn't it that the proposition is attractive to everybody involved it's got to deliver value for the founders but it's got to deliver value in some sense for the people that are participating in it um, and I wondered how that would tie in, or where anybody else thought. Does anyone else want to kick off on that? <laughs> or I? Well, actually, I mean, I, I've got I've got a sort of conundrum based on this really at the moment, where um, when we have a main owner, so we don't have any investors or, or anything like that, uh, and I mean, essentially, he's looking for people to join our community to create content that he can monetize. Um, and so, like the the ROI for him is quite quite clear. Like what what we offer in terms of building this community is content that he can monetize, and he can quantify that, you know, through through whatever channel he's using. Um, uh, but then, for for us to then sell that to our uh, our audience or our consumers or our, our, our community, um, we have to define a value to them as well. I feel, um, and I don't know I don't know how successfully we're doing that, but. I'd be interested to see like what everyone else thinks about how you communicate uh, value of participation or how you make yourself appealing to to your community. I guess, um, which is I guess you know, quite quite a broad subject. <laughs> um, yeah, I, yeah I, and, and I, maybe just balancing those two things out as well. Yeah, I, I've had a little experience of this with um, um, a couple of my clients, and uh, and typically, um, especially if you if you're a larger enterprise. Use this example of, of actually um, helping. You know, the, the objective is to monetize content that somebody else produces. If you can offer the exposure uh, for these people, um, if you can offer them a platform to get them recognition, I think this this is a nice way of uh, um, of actually giving something back. So 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 there's something in it for them. Because otherwise, it's just like uh, I, I just want to exploit this community. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah I, I mean, I is quite a nice example um, because they they took their sort of online community and, and the very best members from that community. Um, what was they, the name of Addy? Sorry. Uh, Lego. Oh. Um, and, and they they took those sort of core members and they they started sort of co-creating their next generation of products with those people. Um, and I think that's quite a, an attractive proposition um, for people that clearly love a particular brand. Um, if they can have a hand in, in sort of creating its future, that's that's pretty attractive, I think. Um, and it helps to marry up their individual ambitions with the ambitions of the 
the organisation and the sponsor of the community itself. That's what they were quite. They were quite technical people, weren't they? I, I remember reading that when he sent this to me. They were quite sort of techy, sort of like they weren't school kids in a in a school building Lego. They were like they, it was. No. It was more than that, wasn't it? Yeah, it was the grown up kids. <laughs> and then, and what happened to the? And then they they built a whole new kit. It was going redundant, you said. And then um, Lego asked them in. It was quite a small group. And then uh, and, and they brought a whole new sort of product range. Is that am I right? I think yeah. You're saying that? Yeah. I mean, it's a, a sort of modern take on, a, on an old-fashioned focus group, I guess. So um, I suppose the main question, or bringing it back to the original point of the Hangout, is how, how you measure the ROI. And, and I wonder how, I mean, all the community managers that are here and that, that watch these Hangouts, how much time they need to spend really thinking about ROI if they're going to be involved in the community. How important would you think that is? Um, I'd, I'd say it's pretty fundamental, um, and even if it's not something that really gets our juices flowing as community managers, it's, it's pretty certain that it's going to get the juices flowing of the people in, in the boardroom and the C-suite, um, because their, their sole interest really is in, in outcomes, um, and, and if our communities aren't providing the outcomes that matter to them, then we're never going to get traction in the boardrooms. and get the organizational wide support that we want to to make these communities a part of the the DNA of our organizations almost. Um, and it's going to be tough to get it out of the marketing department that most communities exist in at the moment. So something I think that, you know, often we can talk about is sort of the opportunities to create or you can you can find instances where people have um you know, good good interactions in the communities, and, and you do provide value. But I was talking to our um, ops director last night about the hangout, and he sort of has a financial background. And he was saying, from his point of view, um, you know, if we were sort of running a community for him, it's very important for him to be able to assign a value to the community. And and I suppose that's what um that's the thing people maybe side skirt a little bit, isn't it? You know, saying how how do I assign a value to the work that we've done to the, to the community that we're running? Does anybody have any thoughts about that? I think starting, uh, um, I mean, if, if you want to get towards a return on investment, you first need to know how much it's going to cost. Mm -hmm. um, so what sort of resources you, you, you have to uh, uh, actually put in to help build this community. I don't know, uh, speaking tech and platform-wise, it, it, it's fairly cheap. But then, um, uh, I, I, speak, speaking as a content person, um, the cost of, of creating valuable content that they will actually engage with is quite high. I don't know if anybody else has uh, 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 any thoughts on the actual costs. I think certainly from an enterprise perspective... Doesn't it kind uh, of depend on what you're trying to achieve and how much that community... Yep, Liz? Sorry, I was just going to say, I mean, I think, I think costs were a sort of, it's, it's so much a piece of string, isn't it? And it, you know, I've seen communities that require no input at all because the community desperately want the community. You know, there doesn't need to be a community manager. Um, they act, they're there because they drive so much value and the cost of running it is, is next to nothing. So, for example... Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's um, my kids at school. Um, we have community, we have Facebook groups for each school year, and the parents are, you know, desperate to be involved in those communities because they ask for homework and things like that. That's a, a community where there's real value um, because people need the information. You need to connect with people. It makes it a lot easier. Uh, local communities, I've seen it again on Facebook. Um, and in there, the goal change. We, we sort of the person that set it up um, had to sort of restrict what the community was used for because it got expanded by the people using it. You know, it started off with only mm. a few people. Now it's got over you know thousands. Um, local people sharing stuff they want to sell and and roadworks and and all the sort of useful information. There's a desperate need. I mean, nobody really runs it. Just people are desperate to share mm. that information and interact, and people ask questions and they respond. It's. 
I like the I like your example of the of this of the school or the you know the, the college community or someone like that where they're running that community. And if you if you were put on a spot and you had to assign like a value to it, do you think maybe you'd be able to say that that had saved? Um, you know, if, if if a college or a school was to be running that kind of community, they're not sort of doing sort of the newsletters. They're not investing the time into having to connect all of those different people up. So there is a real sort of return, even if it's not sort of as an, an overt value the way that you might imagine it. Exactly. I mean, there's. I'm actually in talks because at the moment, um, you know, Facebook groups for schools is is quite not quite cutting edge, but you know, a lot of schools are saying no. A lot of parents have been told you're not allowed to create groups. Um, we've sort of gone ahead as parents and we've created these groups. We manage them, and now the school is seeing the value. And there, I'm actually talking to my daughter's school about the school actually taking ownership because they right. see the value um, and you know we've talked about the fact it's saving them time because a number of people that post on questions about something about homework or whatever and other parents respond saving that parent having to go into the school to ask the question that's a really really good example um, what do you think what do you think Addy? yeah I think there's some fascinating things going on in, in the world of schools and, and their use of social media, um, and I've come across a couple recently where they're using platforms like Google Hangouts and that to collaborate jointly on projects with with other schools in in other countries around the world, um, which I think is pretty neat that you can team up with a, a school in New York on on your science project. You know, I think that's. That's pretty exciting for kids. I mean, it gives them a, a nice cultural experience, um, and also gives them a, an understanding that social media can be used for for helping them with their work um, rather than just for playing farm bill or, or mucking around and things like that. Um, so it's it's good in any number of ways, and obviously ties back in then to the results they're achieving in their exams and their coursework. The um, let's say the thing that strikes me about the Facebook community or sort of like a college is that there's sort of a common need there, isn't there? Everybody's involved in that sort of institution, and it's not sort of I wouldn't say the interests are separate, are they? Whereas if you wanted to build sort of maybe like let's say as Cass was saying he wants to do some sort of like a business community in a sense, so that's where somebody wants something, somebody wants the content. And somebody else, uh, and he wants to incentivize that people to produce the content. Or, for instance, um, you know, Jack and I work on BizCrowd, so RBS have created the community, and then businesses take part in it. And maybe that's a slightly different kind of thing. Do you see what I mean? I was, I was interested in the, um, in sometimes how to align those, um, those, uh, those interests up. What you know, what people want. So a return of investment. Thinking about. There has to be a return of investment for the stakeholder, but there has to be a return of investment for the users too. I'd probably, uh, <laughs> probably garble with that. What I'm trying to say up. Do you, do you see what I'm trying to get at? With yeah. the school community, everybody's in it for together, right? Do you see what I mean, Steve? Yeah, I think there's quite a big difference between um, taking an already existing community online. This is perhaps the. Oh uh, yeah. I mean, this is quite easy to do because it's more a question of. Um, you know, okay, it already exists. Uh, there's there's a common need. So hey, why don't we help? You know, pull these people towards one nice common platform and and, and get them a bit more focused. But you have to, if like you're saying, if you have to move from scratch. Um, so if we if we take Lego and schools and actually uh, uh, people who are already engaged around something, as opposed to. Um, trying to create from scratch, and I think IBM is probably uh, um, uh, a better, uh, uh, a good example of this. Then it's really quite a different thing because first of all, you have to find out who these people are. Um, obviously, you set your goals. And um, AD, do you, do, you, do you think you know, what, what's the strategy on on creating a business community or say a big enterprise, a big corporate to be say? Well, I mean, you mentioned earlier, Steve, about the, the costs of setting up um, communities. And I think we all all know that the, the technical costs and the software costs are actually probably quite low in a lot of instances. Um, there, there, there's lots of software out there that doesn't cost a whole lot to create. Um, 
find a certain enterprise sense. There are quite significant political costs involved in, in trying to get a community set up because you need a lot of collaboration from across the organization to get the thing working as you'd like it to work. Um, so there's a quite a strong argument, I think, to almost set up a, a skunk works type project where you're having lots of communities that are very small in scale, very focused, very niche. Um, you can get in some early adopters and people that are very engaged early on in the project. And then if it doesn't work, it hasn't cost much in terms of financial cost, it hasn't cost much in terms of political cost, and so it's not going to sink the entire social business um, ethos if it doesn't work. And you can try out a few different approaches, a few different niches that you want to try this thing in. And then when you do find something that works, then you have the, the real results in terms of ROI that this is delivering real benefit. And you also have some early early adopters that you can use as champions to help spread it a bit further throughout the organization. Um, so hopefully with the ROI you get the senior manager's attention. And with the champions on board then you're getting the people that will help spread it organically throughout their, their individual departments. So I, I think I very much advocate starting small so that you can afford to fail and fail in peace without it. So that jettisoning in the, the whole project. Yeah, I, I think that this is something that um, I, I, I have a sort of to help um, uh, illustrate this to clients. I always talk about the Fab 50. Um, so the, the 50 most fa uh, uh, fabulous people that are really engaged with your, your brand or your company, maybe they're your happiest clients who actually send you back, you know, wow, really love your product. Uh, um, you, you see them sharing a lot of content. Um, so, so these fabulous 50 are, are a great place to start with because if anybody's going to become um, a spokesman in the community, an, up, an upstanding pillar of the community, then it's these folks, right? Yeah. Uh, 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 so if I can just click again, I think that's a really good point, Steve, about the, the Fab 50. I'm just wondering about um, Ben and I have read a uh, little of uh, Richard Millington, I don't know if we're aware of the mm. online communities, and, and he points out the importance of um, recognizing um, but not necessarily t like highlighting, um, you know, online the the silent uh, ma uh, majority who are like the the volume of the community who are quite happily going away using the community very effectively, but they're just they're silent if you like because they're not making a lot of noise. They're not necessarily complaining nor perhaps even sharing, but they're just very they're using the community for exactly its purpose and how it's that um, section of your community who you need to look after. Yeah, we've seen some. We've seen some communities. Me and Jack are well. I'm more of a gamer than Jack, but we've seen some communities where they end up pandering to sort of the vocal minority because those people are sort of going, oh, "I I want this. I don't want this." You know, I hate how you're running this community, and and then suddenly people are running, you know, bending over backwards to change for these small vocal minority when in fact the majority are silent because they're happy, and when you're happy, sometimes you're not always vocal. Is, is that sort of the point you were talking about, Jack? Yeah, exactly, exactly. I just thought it was an interesting um, point to uh, put alongside Steve's because Steve's saying you, you can champion these kind of vocal users, which I think is a, is a good idea, but as well, you've got to acknowledge that there are a lot of the users who are silent are going to be, are going to be content too. I've, I've read, Addy, some interesting stuff um, about sort of the difference between, you know, sometimes people target influencers <laughs> thinking that's where the value lies. But maybe, you know, it can be argued um, that sort of it's much more important not about who the person is in terms of whether they've got a clout score of 60 um, when you're building a community, um, but more of it's about listening. Like social media is about listening and sort of um, spotting when someone's doing something. It's about behavior. You know, so when someone's recommending your, uh, you know, your community, or they've got a problem, and then responding to it, um, I don't know if that's a. Uh, I think that's is that is that the same thing as Fabulous Fifty, Steve, or you know, just spotting when someone is being sort of an advocate of your community when they are being influential, or do you think those fifty people are always the same fifty people? Do you see what I mean? Yeah, I, I, it's an interesting question because the. Um, so there's quite a few people, especially these more vocal people. 
um, they're, they're often great to, 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 to get some uh, um, kick off some action but quite quickly because they share a lot and they're, they're quite influential but then quite quickly um, uh, as, as was it was it Jack I, I think you were just saying that uh, the, the silent majority are also equally important hmm. well so, yeah arguably uh, if not more so yeah, and to yeah. flip it round a bit, how many of us know um, what sort of percentage of our Fab 50, to use Steve's phrase, are, are also our, our best customers? Can we can we connect up in our CRM systems the best community members with our best customers in a financial sense? So I'm not sure that many CRM systems are, are doing that particularly well at the moment. And it's a bit of a, a blind spot, I think. Yeah, I've uh, I've used Fat Social and I've used Nimble. Um, I never really got on with Hootsuite very much, but I'm not saying and there is a lot of fans of Hootsuite out there. Um, what? Well, um, yeah, I think um, I don't know for myself. Sometimes I've been very focused on sort of trying to do a good job in terms of value and sort of looking after people um, within the community and sort of reaching out. Um, and then sort of talking to people like you guys, you know, reading books like, you know, Richard Millington, reading your blog, Addy, you know, there, there's, obviously a, there's obviously a high level. A lot of community managers might be good, pe good, pe good um, people, people, if you see what I'm trying to say. But, um, but, but obviously, if you, if you want to be really good at your job, you have to, del you have to prove the value that you're, that you're creating, don't you? You have to prove that you're, whatever the purpose of the community is, that you're really delivering it. And I think it's important that you can actually prove that. And I think that's, Jack, what you were saying about when we're reading Richie Millington stuff, that, that that's what you are. You've got to be able to prove that you're doing what you're saying you're doing, not just doing it. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, sorry, go on, Addy. Is it Addy? Uh, I, I think I've got an example that yeah. might, might so. sort of help clarify something that we're working on. Um, so obviously we've got our own platform, um, and I don't know if that's any different to how you guys operate, but uh, what we like to do is use like uh, tools like Google Analytics or Mixpanel to track what our users are doing and whether that matches up with uh, what, what we'd like them to do on this site. Um, and in terms of quantifying uh, the community manager's value, I think... Uh, that can be like a useful route to go down because you can prove that you're 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 guiding your your community into actions that um, are quantifiable. I guess. Um, I just thought we'd just pause. We've got Hassan um, Mirza has joined us. Did I say that right, Hassan? Oh, we. You might need to unmute yourself. Myself. Hey, how's it going? How are you guys? Hey. Hi, Hassan. Thanks for joining us. Do you, do you want to uh, sort of introduce yourself and tell us a bit about yourself? Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. I work. Um, I'm the social director of a um, di digital bank, which is a social media agency. Um, and uh, yeah, I, you know, community management is a big part of my role. I was curious. You know, I saw Ben that you've kind of put this out, and um, we're interested in running kind of Google Hangouts too in the future about topics. So. I'm here, you know, to talk about community management, but also to see how you guys do a hangout because um, I think that's a really cool, good way to, you know, share knowledge. That's cool. Um, we, uh, if you wanted to get uh, your name along the bottom, you can get that in the apps on the left. It says a hangout toolbox. Oh, cool. What, what was that called, Liz? A third. Third tier, isn't it? Is it third tier? Lower tier. Third tier. Lower tier. Yeah, you don't want the lower third, you want lower the third. hangout tool, toolbox, and then uh, on the top right you've got lower third. Uh, so you go, just go to view more apps, hangout toolbox, and then you can uh, add it there. I know, I know we've gone off topic there for a second, but... Oh, but cool, yeah, no. But Kaz, yeah, you were saying, I suppose that's, that's a really good point, you're saying how you, how you actually measure, the, the tools that you use to actually measure what you're doing. You're saying you, you use Google Analytics. What other tools do you use? Uh, Mixpanel. <clears throat> so, so tracking like the journey that users uh, go through on our site and what, what actions they're actually taking and how we... I mean, like for example, for us, it's quite easy for us to quantify because when users create content, uh, we can like assign a value to how much we can market that content for or whatever. Um, so we can track up like what they're doing and how much how much uh, return on investment that provides, I guess. So how do, how do you sign that, uh, assign a value to a bit of content? Because I haven't thought of that. Um, well, I mean, our, our, our revenue model is basically an ad revenue model. So we, we serve AdSense and affiliate. Ah. And 
on that content, and we can have. Well, I mean, it depends. It, it's 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 not as straightforward as that, really. But I mean, you can assign a sort of RPM to that content. So could so can I just ask, Cass, could you see? Sorry, was it called Mix Panel? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Could you use that and towards a different revenue system? Like you said that you're creating content, so it works for that, so you can track sure, them from I mean, when they uh, join. Mix Panel itself, you can create events, uh, so you can track up what what users are doing um, on your site. Um, I mean, you probably maybe need to look at it. I mean, it depends on your platform, really. So I, I suggest maybe having a look at it and how it applies to like platforms that you're using. Mm -hmm. um, but if, if it's mainly on social media, if you're using Twitter and Facebook and stuff like that, then maybe you, you're best off just using you know the analytics tools that they provide. Mm. I'd okay. be interested, Addy. You, I think, um, I wish my memory was a little better. But when you when you introduced yourself and you were saying sort of, um, you know, you help sort of finance that kind of thing. Are there kind of how do people, you know, the metrics that people use? Are you involved with sort of saying, okay, this, this is the proposition, and then further down the line, looking at how successful it was? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think um, I'd like to think that community management has evolved a bit from its earlier days when the kind of reports we'd create would be on the number of posts that have been made or how many followers or likes and, and that kind of thing that we've got. Um, so I'd like to think now that the reporting has sort of grown up a bit and it's it's more in tune with the kind of reports that people in other departments throughout the organization are, are producing that. Um, and they all sort of tie in with the organizational goals. Um, I think that's a, certainly an interesting sort of angle. Um, I'd, I'd love you to be really five, candid yeah. and tell us what you don't think are valid metrics. You know, if um, what, what would you think yeah. wasn't valuable? And so if someone was sat down, if I sat down with you and said, "Hey, Addy, this is what I've been doing this community and working with," and I started giving you some reports and some information, and you turn around and go, "Ben, no, no, what are you doing?" <laughs> so, um, and what, what do you think is valid, just from your experience? Um, I mean, the obvious ones are um, things like that number of followers you have on Twitter or the number of likes your page has. Um, firstly, because they don't really yeah, so mean a whole lot. They don't really tie into your organizational goals <laughs> unless your organization exists in order to get followers on Twitter, um, which is unlikely. Um, and also, it's, it's so easy to gain. Um, I think it was Mitt Romney during the presidential election that was caught out for buying a, a whole lot of Twitter followers. Um, and you just look a bit foolish um, <laughs> and show that you don't really get what it's all about. Um, so I think forget anything that's platform related really and, and focus very much on the, the non-technological um, kind of goals and ROI that you can measure. Um, so if you're looking to increase collaboration, for instance, you don't worry about the number of posts that have been made or even the number of members that are on your internal community. Um, worry more about how many new products have been created or how many new processes have, have resulted from the collaborative work that you're doing. Um, focus very much on the business goals rather than the, the technological ones. Yeah. I, I actually have a, um, a, a nice example of this. I'm, I'm Director of Communications at the IEBC, International Association of Business Communicators. Mm. And we recently had a conference in Brussels. And we had um, uh, a lady there, Celine uh, Schillinger, from Sanofi Pasteur. And Sanofi Pasteur, the world's largest vaccines organization. Mm. <clears throat> and. Um, uh, uh, basically, the, her role, she established a community, she's community director there. Um, her argument to the board was basically, um, as McKinsey studies like uh, Women Matters show, that the involvement of women within an organization directly impacts the bottom line. And she identified this gender imbalance because Sanofi Pasteur is a very uh, was a very traditional male hierarchical uh, type of organization. So she actually stepped up and just wrote a letter to the CEO and said, listen, do you know that the best performing organizations have a really good equal gender balance? So uh, she said, I propose that we set up a community and, uh, called Women in Sophie Pasteur, uh, Sanofi Pasteur, 
and um, get their input on the table, get their voices heard. And it was incredibly successful. Um, the, I'm not sure what the actual results were, if that bottom line was affected, but all of a sudden <clears throat> people who didn't previously have a voice within the organization were given a voice. So this kicked innovation along, this kicked ideas along, it broke down some departmental silos and really got information flowing. So I think that's a nice um, example that was uh, ROI-led. Um, how they measured it, I'm not sure, but uh, uh, you should check it out. It's a nice example. Oh, I wondered actually, Steve, whether um, and if anyone else can think of maybe when we sometimes communities happen. I think was it Liz was talking about sometimes they can be sort of they can come together out of um, almost out of nowhere. Do you see what I mean? Not out of nowhere, but they can be brought together because people genuinely want it. Um, and um, maybe the other why that people get isn't always the one that might have been um, intended. That's what the thought was sort of whirling around in my head there. That relates actually to a question I was going to ask is, um, you know, we talked a lot about ROI and measuring it, but can we always measure the ROI? And is it always obvious? Because, um, I mean, on the shows I do, um, we talk about ROI a lot and um, we look more at internal social business rather than external. And um, But we, a lot of people sort of say, well, you know, how do you measure the ROI? I mean, and equate it to what's the ROI of getting dressed in the morning? Or I've heard people say, what's the ROI of your parents? You know, it, it, it's, it's like we don't have to go through um, and justify having email. And at some point, you know, maybe we won't justify having social in the future. We'll just create it uh, and be there. But, you know, it, it, sometimes there are soft benefits that you can't always quantify. Do we think that's true? Um, I, I I disagree, to be honest. I, I mean, I I believe that you can quantify anything, really. Um, I, I mean, I know you, you mentioned, like, you know, really, really uh, good examples, like getting dressed in the morning or something like that, and how would you quantify that, for example. But, I mean, I think, like, if you follow the journey or the path that anything takes um, and what the outcome of those those actions are, then those can be quantified, like, regardless of what it is. Uh, I would probably also add on to that as well, that... um. The difficulty you might have with, I don't know if that approach might be so accepted in a larger organization if you've got like a financial, like Addy was talking before about the strict kind of ROI and the, the, the Twitter followers and you want some kind of strict deliverance. I'm not sure if um, the kind of, if, if you were to explain it is I can't quite quantify this, this, this uh, benefit whether that would kind of wash within a kind of, I don't know, more of a business-related context, as well, opposed to a social one, which I think maybe it would, like you were saying with your Facebook and, and your kids. There's, there's something that me and Jack talk about, or when I talk at Jack about, is and I really what Liz says does resonate with me, because I often say to Jack, there's value that I'm delivering that no one's ever going to see. You know, like I know that I'm doing things that are creating value in the communities that we're working that people won't see, but there's also, I feel like, Maybe pressure is the wrong word, but I know my ops director, and I've got to make sure that I'm showing and proving that I am delivering value. Do you see what I mean? So I think, Liz, you're right about that there are sort of maybe, there is benefit delivered that isn't tangible, but I also think sometimes in the business sense, you've also got to maybe make an extra effort to, to prove that there's some value. You know, like your example with the Facebook um, group where you're saving teachers time, you're saving them putting together a newsletter. It's probably not the greatest benefit. Maybe the sense of community is more valuable, you know? But sometimes when you're talking to a finance guy, you need to be able to talk numbers and assign values. What do you think? Yeah, I, I think it, even with um, something as, as uh, if you think about this Sanofi Pasteur thing, for example. Um, the, the what thing, sorry? The Sanofi Pasteur. So, so this, this uh, uh, women in so, uh, Sanofi Pasteur. Mm. Um, even if it's something like employee satisfaction, I mean, typically if, if there's sort of no community there, so not a lot of interaction, not a lot of talk, if you benchmark it first and go in and identify that objective, okay, we need to get employees happier or more informed, you can, you can always benchmark stuff. So even if it's employee yeah. satisfaction or interactions or something, I think uh, you, you, you can measure it. So, Adi, that leads me to want to ask you, 
Like, how important is it setting what your real intentions or what the real goal of the community is at the outset? You know, if we get Liz in to build a sense of community, but maybe what the people really want is something different, do you, have any, do you think that's something that's worth touching on? Yeah, I think that there can be different goals depending on who you ask within the community. I mean, we, we touched earlier on... Um, what the motivation is for community members to participate and, and what they get out of it. And that's the motivation is very different to what the organization gets out of it for sponsoring it. Um, and I don't think they necessarily have to um, match up necessarily. I mean, you're not going to get community members that get up in the morning and think, I, I want to make this company more money or save it from hiring people in their call centers or whatever, that, that's not going to happen. Um, but I think if you have an organizational goal and you can cascade that down into what the members get out of it and, and somehow try and connect those two up, then I think it can be can work pretty well still. I, th I think that's a really, really good like way to put it, actually, because I think like as, com as a community manager, I feel like I'm my role is to try and provide value or promote value to both sides of the equation. So like uh, you want to promote the value of your community and participation to your community users, but you also want to promote the value of sponsoring the community to whoever is investing in it. And those things, I mean, could be yeah, completely different. As you said, like for, for example, for us, I have to provide the value of you know, creating a community and sponsoring it to create content. But, um, but then on the other hand, I have to promote the value of uh, creating that content to our users. So, like, you know, what, what, what would they get out of it, whether, they, whether it be promotion or, uh, yeah, whatever, whatever else would motivate them to do it. Okay, guys. Um, so, Addy, uh, we're coming up to, is it an hour now we're on almost? We'll make it about 50 about minutes. minutes okay, no, I just, I just thought I didn't want to sort of, um, I wanted to check on whether there's anything else you wanted to incorporate into the chat or any other points that we should have uh, touched on before the... Uh... I think ROI is such a, a massive topic, mm. isn't it? We could be here for, for days if we, if we wanted to get under every nook and cranny of it. Um, what do you think about people... Chance to follow up on this online somewhere on the... On the well, yeah, we're going to do, me and Jack are going to go do in slide deck afterwards and try and put together something that we can all share with you guys that would Brilliant. be easily shareable with the link as well. Um, but I suppose just the last thing, I suppose, is, you know, what all of your advice would be. If somebody is watching this and maybe they are looking after a community and they wanted to start showing a return of investment, they wanted to start sort of showing some values from that community, do you have any advice of that, how to start showing ROI if you didn't have any experience of sort of for me and Jack, you know, we know what our metrics are and we know how we, what we have to show to our directors. But, it, but for someone that maybe, like you, know, like you were saying, Liz, you know, maybe a community start, started with a school, they've started a community and they say, okay, I want to be a bit more serious about it now. Or, or someone's walked into a job and they're taking over yeah. someone's Facebook. You know? I've, I've, I've got something, actually. Mm -hmm. um, one thing to bear in mind when you want to create a community, you can't force people to be a community. Um, there's no point saying I've got I'm going to create a community for my business or whatever and say I'm going to make everyone use it in this way that's right, yeah. and that's going to give me benefit because I'm going to benefit from people reacting interacting like that so that's what they're going to do um, a community will only be successful and provide you with any sort of ROI if you provide you create the community on the basis of something that that community needs so they will only interact if you provide you are providing a, 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 an area to be able to achieve their own objectives. Because people in the community, it's not just you that's got the objectives. The mm. people that are in the community have their own objectives, and they will only engage if they're getting something out of that engagement. Mm. I, I think that's a really good point as well. Because I mean, mm. I, I remember this course that I went on uh, quite recently. And there was uh, someone attending there that wanted to create a community around their insurance product, and like the way that she had approached it, like it 
was completely nonsensical to me. Like, why would anyone want to get involved in a community to do with that? And it, I think it was like specifically life insurance as well, so it had a limited scale as well. But, um, uh, like, yeah, I mean, I, th I think the, the point is, I mean, I have a theory that there is no such thing as creating communities. What I think is that you identify niches where either there is already a community that's starting to develop and you nurture it and then try to guide it towards maybe something that will be beneficial to you as well. Or, um, alternatively, you find a niche where there isn't that sense of com community, but like, like Liz said, that people want it or like there is a need for it. And then you provide that to them and that's already a value organically. And then, yeah, you try, you try to, I guess, go from there. Steve, any advice? Uh, I, I, th I think that was, that was a great insight from Cass then. Where I, re I, th I think that's actually the core of it. Um, taking the content to angle, I would always... Uh, uh, first of all, benchmark, and there's enough analytics that can actually um, identify influencers from, like, for example, in G+, Google Ripples, yeah. uh, visitor flow in analytics. These sort of things show you how people are engaging with your content and with each other. And uh, uh, these are really nice, useful um, basics to, to have in place to start with so that you can track any progress. So, so that, that would be my piece of advice. Focus on uh, the actual content that's being shared and, and try to help it map out who your network, uh, your potential community actually is. There are, there are measuring tools like Google Ripples. There's, um, Jack, what's the Twitter one that we uh, tweet reach, is it? Tweet reach, yeah. Tweet reach. Um, Sprout Social has got reports coming out of our ears. So <laughs> we can't even put so many reports. We can't even uh, do anything with them. Um, Addy, what was the, to sort of, um, I mean, to summarise it towards the end, what, any advice from you after hearing all of that? Um, I try very much to tie whatever it is you're doing into what the organisation's trying to achieve and figure out the best way that social and, and communities can help your organisation to do its job to the best of its ability. And if you can do that, then hopefully you, you derive something that you can measure from it. And if and if someone was to take over a community or they wanted to start proving other why, any advice on that? Um, again, I'd, I'd very much take it back to its basics and figure out what it is it's trying to achieve, um, and then have the social ROI and the financial ROI from that. And then you've got something you can actually take to the boardroom and, and talk in their language. Um, well, one thing I would say, guys, and thank you for everyone for coming coming to the Hangout. I mean, it's the first one I've ever done, so I apologize for the huge technical stuff at the beginning. But, um, yeah, have a look at um, Addy's, uh, Addy's blog. I've got it in my RSS feed. Um, I found it really interesting um, reading it on the bus while I'm, <laughs> when I'm coming into work. So, um, yeah, have a look at that. And, um, yeah, I suppose that will wrap that up now, and then me and Jack are going to work on a slide deck, and we'll email it to you. And then share that with the community. And I'd like to thank you all for, you know, for being part of this, and especially you know, Addy, Liz, Cass, Steve, and uh, and Jack, obviously. Thanks. Thanks yeah, very much, guys. Thanks. Thanks. Cool. Thanks. Great to meet you. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Bye -bye. Addy. Bye -bye.